Go in search of half-built houses where the sun sets tattered lofts alight, a flash above darkened, nettled rooms. Between the bare rafters lie miles of sky, divided by wire lines, joining other, finished places where the money lasted long enough to install some doors. Stand in the empty frame at the edge of the fields and watch the fen blow itself away, disturbed by the turning of men. Imagine the landscape is a book, open flat for the reading. Imagine you know what it means. See the evening fall like a print immersed in solution. Stay still. Filter out the damage and dust of the day. Look past its sharp reflections to the washes beyond, to us. Then you will find the fire in the fen, flame in the water, flare of a swallow caught in flight. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's so lovely to hear a modern take on Fenlon life. But of course, people have been writing about the Fens for centuries. And they've been writing in verse. And our early historian, Janet Fairweather, has transcribed the descriptions by Brother Gregory in the 12th century. A place there is where liquid honey drops like dew, so people say. The namers call it by the name of Downham a delightful place, rich, fertile, gold, where ploughlands freely give props enough. Rivers of fish are noticed as at hand nearby. Here, while a sweet breeze wafts around, sings every bird. Between Mary and the Pope uh, and the monk, there have been numerous people recording in verse. Some of you may be here today. Mike Delnoy, Edward Travis, Dedmund Heath, Edward Storey, Pat Blake, Dennis Pye. Perhaps some of you may have been part of that Witchwood Village College who came together to produce your fen full of folk anthology. As part of the hundreds of volumes of poetry which are preserved in the Cambridgeshire Collection at Cambridge Library. And because they are there, then we can look back on their work. But of course, there have been folk who are no longer with us. Frank Harold Clark from the 1890s. Richard Ramsey Fielder, the King of Upware. Mrs Knowles from Wiccan. Hilda Everett from Haddenham, and that poet praised by Queen Victoria and Charles Dickens, who was as famous in his day as Burns, the one you've totally forgotten, James Withers. And those of you who remember James, how can you forget the start of his poem on Wiccan? Going to your church is like going out of town. Not pleasant at all when the rain's coming down. OK, but he did come from Fordham, and he perhaps can be excused. But there are those other poems which people do remember. Uh, a few weeks ago at the Cambridgeshire Association of Local History, we were handing out an, uh, Lifetime Achievement Awards and we handed one out to a lady from Littleport who stood up and recited a poem that had been with her all her life, one that appeared in Punch in 1925. Men till the fields at Littleport, the spreading fields and low, and as they toil amid the soil, I wonder if they know that where they drop the yellow grain an ocean used to flow, and little ships to little keys came gladly after tossing seas, and sailors laughed and took their ease long, long ago. 
That may not be historically accurate. It may not be necessarily good verse, but it summons a place and a time that has stayed with somebody in their memory, and it's shaped the way they look. But I suppose inevitably we need to look at who might be the more important of the people who have depicted Fenland, some of whom perhaps were not people. They may have been fish. And I'm sure many of you know that standard poem that was produced about the drainage to Fens and the opposition to drainage. The one that was written by the pout, the pouts complain. And if you know it, then recite it along with me. Come, brethren of the water, and let us all assemble to treat upon this matter which makes us quake and tremble. For we shall rue, if it be true, the fens be undertaken, and where there grew both sedge and reeds, they'll now feed beef and bacon. For they do mean all fens to drain and waters overmaster, and they will make of bog and lake for Essex cows a pasture. And again, part of the proof in that fen fish are educated, they then go on to appeal to various gods to help them, including to Neptune. Great Neptune, god of seas, this work must needs provoke thee. They mean thee to disease, and with fen waters choke thee. But with thy mace thou canst deface and quite confound their matter. So send some sand to make firm land where they do want fresh water. And of course, aren't they clever? They are anticipating the build-up of silt and sand, which is going to lead to the silting, which is going to be a perennial problem to those attempting to drain the fens. And they call on the various spirits to help them. And they call on the moon. And last, we pray the moon that she will be propitious and see that naught be done to prosper the malicious. And of course, in that period of opposition to drainage, much would be done in the dark while the moon hid her light behind a cloud. But the fish were tacticians. They needed they help from good old Captain Flood. They're appealing to the tides and the moon and the weather to come together. That summer's heat may cause a fret, whereby themselves they flatter. Yet be so good as send a flood, lest those Essex cows lack water. And again, isn't it interesting now the way that Chris Hongley will tell us that some of our Fenland water is being sent to Essex now? for Essex folk to drink. It's all going round. We know of the benefits that drainage would bring. It was published in Jonas's Moore's History or Narrative of the Great Level of the Fens in 1653. The one that was accompanied in the volume that went with this map originally this fantastic map of the Fens after drainage that I'm sure you have all got your own copy well and truly booked for. But what are they saying? I sing floods muzzled and the ocean tamed, luxurious rivers governed and reclaimed, Water within banks confined as in a jail, till kinder sluices let them go on bail. Streams curbed with dams like bridles, taught to obey, and run as straight as if they saw their way. We could, in the 1700s, in the 1600s, we could tame it. But inevitably, nature comes back at you. Inevitably, there is flood, as was described by a Fen Parson, 
in that voice, the inundation or the life of a fen man published in 1751. So now three watery moons incessant rain came pouring down upon the marshy plain. From all the neighboring hills the torrents glide and meet the influx of the foaming tide. Waves rolled on waves, accumulated rise, and intermixed their waters with the skies. The stoutest bank in vain opposed their force, in vain at the art of man repels their course. A breach at last is made, the currents pour through the deep chasm with tremendous roar. The alarmed inhabitants desert their home, whilst round their dwellings raging billows foam. But take them to their car oars and safely row over those very lands they used to plough. And that's a description of flooding in the 1700s, which is going to come so true so often, even into the 20th century, and particularly with the great flood that we shall be remembering next year in 19, of 1947. But as we know, the benefits of drainage had to be preserved by mechanical means, and machines had to be worked by men, men like William Harrison of Pima. Harrison found work in Burnt Fen as a drainage engineer. Harrison witnessed that massive piece of civil engineering that ensured the prosperity of Ely, the digging of that Sandys cut straight to Littleport that made Prickwillow literally a backwater. Harrison worked the wind pumps that puddled the water out of the Fenland up into the higher rivers. Those Fen wind pumps that by the 1830s were not working. As he said in his poem, those poor old mills had done their best to have our drainage once redressed, though often in the time of need found anything but friends indeed. When winds were low and floods were high, with outstretched pinions to the sky, they stood in utter helplessness, exchanging signals of distress. While murmurs frequent and profound arose from those whose lands were drowned, and those wind pumps could not cope with the changing situation, and they needed new technology, and that technology was steam. And Harrison envisages the wind pumps talking. Meanwhile, you little Soho toy kept smoking with malicious joy, as if intent to spoil our trade and drain those fens without our aid. And of course, those giant steam engines themselves have now gone, uh, apart, of course, from Streatham. They were replaced with other pumps, more effective pumps, diesel pumps, which are themselves now often museum pieces and were better appreciated than in that fantastic Prick Willow Museum, where the most valuable exhibits are those skilled men who know how to work those giant machines. But diesels have now been replaced largely by electricity. As was reported at the opening of the Oxlode pumping station in 1962, in verses by one of the great Fen drainage engineers, W.E. Duran, formerly chief engineer to the Great Ouse River Board, 
and the man, of course, who is remembered for his work in those 1947 floods. But in 1962, they wrote, We formerly on wind relied, and then the power of steam was tried. Then came the diesel's instant power, and stayed until this current hour. Today, another page is turned, nor coal nor diesel oil is burned. I close the switch, I throw the main, comes power to empty, brimming drains. And that, of course, is electricity. And, of course, we always will have electricity, won't we? Perhaps generated by those um, wind turbines. But although the giant steam engine pumps have gone, the pumping engine houses remain. Cathedrals to drainage. And on the front of one of those, perhaps the greatest, are a few words. These fens have oftentimes been by water drowned. Science in water, a remedy found. The power of steam shall be employed, and the destroyer by itself destroyed. And these words are carved in stone on the 100-foot pumping station. Words written by that Pima lad, William Harrison, who was buried in Little Port. 143 years ago, in January 1873, William Marshall spoke about Harrison at a lecture in the reading room at Ely. The room was crammed with at least 400 people. He wrote, he wrote some of his verse, more than 12,000 lines of poems, and he read Harrison's work for two hours. Harrison had died the previous year, but his work must be preserved, all agreed. He was amongst the purest and the choicest of the poets England had ever produced. It would be a tragedy if such valuable compositions should be lost. But they have been. They tried to revive them in 1893. Perhaps now, let us hope that some of our modern poets who have the skill to come at what is happening now, might be helped revive something of Harrison and his input. And can you give us another impression of Fenland from one of your poems to round off? Thank you, Mike. Um, this poem that I'm going to read is called From Mara Morish to the Fens. Um, and it's actually the poem uh, which I entered into the Fenland Poet Laureate competition um, last, last earlier this year. Um, for those of you who don't know Maramorish, it's a place in Romania in the Carpathian Mountains. And it's a place where land ownership has historically been really strongly contested um, and land is, is quite scarce. Um, it's also a place where traditional methods of farming are still used and traditional methods of land uh, measurement are used, which kind of explains a couple of references in the poem. Um, I guess the reason that I juxtaposed there with here um, was I was reading about it in the papers and um, just reading about the extent to which land ownership was so violently contested and made me think about the different uses of the land within the Fens historically, um, some of the things that Mike's been talking about um, and how uh, they kind of Show, show up in today's society, I guess, in a different way. So this is from Maramorish to the Fens. There, the strips of land are narrower than a palmer, a hand span, a heart span, fortified by buried stones. There, mountains from the sea, the earth is hard to farm. Growing seasons stretch a hundred days, 
Lives are landlocked, pointed. Memories go back a hundred years to dark lines on maps set by serfdom, rested in war, erased by the new men. Cherry blossom falls on the chickens, pecking at the ground as a man picks up his hedge knife, reaches over the boundary, a breath's breadth, and stabs his neighbour in the back. Stones are moved, bloodlines rewrite old divides. Here, our garden is a raff, an arm's breadth. We argue over wooden fences held by nails falling at night in the east wind. Here, violence is buried deep as bog oak, emerging in the papers, blowing like leaves before a storm. Divisions run straight across the country in drainage channels, blocks of houses, private estates, huge flat squares of farm. Trenches are dug in mines, settled in. Wild places are washed out around us. We write a letter of complaint. Thank you. <laughs>